Welcome into K State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Drew Galloway, and we are here after a tight, surprisingly, K State loss in Provo, Utah. The Cats they fall on the road, seventy-two to sixty-six to BYU. Uh, K State got off to a decent start. You get eight points just like that from Day Day Ames, and then you never hear from him again. He hit two threes for you. You, you kind of got to be able to take advantage of that when you get production like it from somebody you're not counting on it from the problem for K-State ended up being that the three guys that you count on most were non-existent for most of the game and not only were they non-existent they made costly mistakes throughout the game and in addition to that BYU was just too much to to overcome because they've got a great home court environment but number one they're really just a great basketball team the way they are built is to perfection. They're surrounded by shooters, so you have to take the perimeter seriously. And then they have just big, demanding guys inside that K-State just isn't in a position to be able to to kind of hang with right now because, as was uh, pointed out by many, either directed towards me or from me on uh, Twitter during the game, K-State has a, a real problem with their bigs right now because they're just not that good. And we saw all of this play a part in the 72-66 to loss tonight. Yeah, it. I never would have guessed coming into the game that if you would have told me that the BYU bigs would be the reason that they won the game, and for the most part, it was a pretty comfortable one for BYU. Like uh, Ali Khalifa hadn't played in the last two games due to illness and came out and kind of kicked K-State's butt in the first half, to be completely honest. And then uh, Traore came in in the second half and picked up right where Khalifa did. It, it was just a, a nonstop uh, effort by the two bigs for BYU in a game where you really regret not getting this for K-State because BYU didn't shoot the ball particularly well tonight. 8 of 25 from 3, 6 of 12 in the first, or in the second half. But if you would have told Jerome Tang that they would have held BYU to 8 of 25 from 3, you're probably thinking that you're in the game and potentially win the game. But instead, Casey really didn't get it that close until it was too little too late. And kind of in a cruel twist of fate, one of the three pointers that BYU made in the second half comes and it's the dagger on what kind of ruined your entire comeback. Casey had been playing really well defensively and we're starting to make shots on offense. And then you fall asleep for two seconds on defense and the game goes from a two point game to a five point game with 50 seconds to go. And you kind of wasted that entire five minute stretch where you went on a 13 0 run. Well, and that was that was a tough one, too, because I mean, we talked about it in in the pregame and everything. But Jackson Robinson is is one of those guys that I mean, he, he's a good three point shooter this season. Like he's 36 percent. He you'd kill to have a guy like that on K-State's roster right now. But he is very much a volume guy, and it's about getting him up. And that was, a, that was a volume type of shot where, for him, it's not a terrible shot. But I think if you would ask Mark Pope coming out of that timeout, that's probably not the shot he was actually wanting in that situation. But it worked out in the end, and K-State just got burnt there. And that's the, that's the thing that this team puts themselves in position to, to have happen is that, they too many times this year have left games to be decided by either the ball not bouncing their way or the three guys holding the whistle. And that is just the sign of a team that too many times shoots themselves in the foot to get to a certain spot or just isn't good enough to overcome that stuff. And I, I think this K state team is the, the perfect example of what you would think of for maybe like an NIT team because they're good enough to beat good teams, but they're bad enough to lose the bad teams and they just can't always overcome their mistakes. And it puts them in a really tough spot. And that's what we saw again tonight where they made the charge at the end. They made it a competitive game, um, but for the majority of it, they were not in it. And BYU kind of took their foot off the gas k-state credit to them for not ever quitting though and and making it a tight game and one that you could almost steal but that's now become the problem is that you almost stole a game in lubbock stillwater was a disaster i don't know what you want to call that but that's a game that you should have won as well uh despite how they played 
and then this one. And you just came up short if you're K State, and still your only road win is against a team that just got beat by almost 40 points today uh, by Texas. So this is just one of those deals, and and why it makes it paramount that K State is able to come up successful uh, in their next couple of tries at home. And I mean, that's you go back to that Oklahoma loss; that's going to stick out too. You get beat by 20 on your home floor. You just can't do that if you're not good enough to win on the road. And winning on the road is tough in the Big 12. If you read Pat Forty's story that he had in Sports Illustrated either yesterday or today, but I read it today, he, he put in there that I think the national average of winning home games this year in college basketball is like right around 56%. It's at, it's over 64%, close to 65% in the Big 12, which, I mean, you would think, well, isn't the Big 12 like really competitive? It is, but that just goes to show – how much the home courts mean in the Big 12 and how good these teams are that they're not losing on their home floors all that much. You are giving up games in this league and to everybody else you're trying to compete to get in the NCAA tournament with if you're losing home games. And that's why K-State down the stretch is going to have to steal one of these games eventually. And tonight, although not ideal and in odd circumstances, it does in a roundabout way feel like maybe you let an opportunity slip uh, because you were good enough for a certain stretch of this game to play with BYU, and you got BYU to only shoot 32% from three. They they were 10 of 21 at the free throw line. Like, that's another big part of this. And we can talk about the decision at the end. K-State chooses to play out the possession. They end up giving up an easy bucket uh, with like six seconds left, and, and BYU was able to officially win the game there instead of K-State getting the ball back uh, and a chance to to try and do something. What did you make of K-State playing out that last possession defensively and they would have gotten the ball with like seven seconds left and needed to go down the floor and score? Uh, to be honest, it, it was a, a confusing decision for me. Uh, like I, I know K-State had been holding their own defensively in the, the final stretch of the game, but that that also just screams where K-State, if they got a stop, BYU was just going to foul. And, and then you're having to get the offensive rebound on the second free throw and get a shot to send it to overtime where with how BYU was shooting from the free throw line I, and they're not, they're a pretty good free throw shooting team, but they're, they're not, no, they're nothing like special on the season. So I, I think I would have rather prolonged the game instead of having the defense play it out. And, and it especially just looks bad when, I'm not really sure what Arthur Kluma was trying to do on that possession when he got beat. Like it looked like he was in like an in between of trying to foul and also trying to get the steal and ended up with neither. And BYU just got an uncontested layup. So it it was a strange decision for me in the sense of there just wasn't enough time. If there's like 45 seconds left, I'm I'm totally fine with that. I'd rather have them play it out. But with 37 seconds left, that's just not enough time, I think, to get a good shot on offense because you're probably not going to get a good shot or a shot at, at all. Yeah, in, in general, I don't hate playing out the possession when you would get the ball back with that much time. But to your point, BYU does probably foul. And the one thing that I will say is that, and you can't always rely on this, but – BYU was 10 of 21 at the free throw line in the game. That seems like a team that you, you might feel like, hey, maybe a couple times we try to play the free throw game with them and see what happens here. And you, you weren't able to do that. And, and it's also especially a, a curious decision. And look, maybe this is Jerome Tang saying like, hey, we got to go out and win games this year. And if this is how my guys think that they can go out and win a game, I'm going to let them go out and try and prove it. And they proved that they couldn't do it in this game. So maybe the next game is when Jerome Tang says, all right, we're doing this my way now. You know, we tried it your way. You couldn't go out and do it. This is how we're playing it this time out. But also BYU shoots 73% from the free throw line on the season. So it, it just depends on who goes to the line. They could have thrown a lineup out there with guys that that play enough that all shoot like 75% or better and four of them are 80% or better. So BYU could have made their free throws if, if they needed to, uh, e even though the 10 of 21 is a little bit, you know, jarring when you look at the final numbers and, and how it ends up playing out in this game but i'm i'm okay with it it's just k-state had a giant breakdown and and that shouldn't be totally surprising given their personnel and how they've played most of the season so 
I don't think it's egregious that, that K-State played it out there, uh, but I, I certainly think if you're sitting around right now going, man, that was really stupid, I'm, I'm not going to call you wrong for that. It, it just goes to show, I think, kind of the overarching kind of theme of this team of they kind of lack maturity at times and they lack focus at times because this team, I can guarantee you, that they will agree with the statement that they probably didn't play as hard as they did tonight as they did Monday against KU. And that they had a lot more breakdowns defensively mm-hmm. and a lot of more rush shots offensively where they really never got into a flow on offense until, <laughs> until it was too late. So it's more of, I think, an overarching leadership and maturity issue for this team of you need to be focused and bring it for a full 40 minutes because it's game 24 that just transpired. And I'm not sure if K-State's played a full 40 minutes for like, yes, this was like the best version of them all game. You got that a little bit against Baylor, but I think that the team that this team can shoot the ball better than they did against Baylor. So I'm not sure if you can even say that. So you're, you're still waiting for a full 40 minutes and the season's almost over and that, that that's pretty concerning and where to your point it's more of like that's what an IT team does yeah I just you look around and like that's you know it happens like the just things go don't go your way but uh this team like this isn't oh some bad bounces this season is cost them like you could say that but you make your own luck to a certain extent and K-State has made a lot of bad luck for themselves this year. Now, look, I don't want this to be too doom and gloom because going into this game, I think most of us agreed and, and said, look, whatever the outcome is in Provo, that is not going to change my opinion of this team, good or bad. It might change the outlook in a good way. I don't think this changes K-State's outlook in a bad way because you went in expecting this to probably be a loss. Like, realistically... Yeah, you could win there, but the numbers would tell you BYU is going to win at home because they're a better team, they have the home court advantage, and all these other reasons that stack into it. But it does set up now that K-State has to come through and step up when they play, again, a week from today against TCU in Manhattan. They get this full week off to rest up and get ready to play a TCU team that is coming off a pretty tough loss at TCU in terms of how they looked. It was not the prettiest of games for Jamie Dixon's team. And so TCU is not playing their best basketball at this point in the season. Both teams are are right around middle of the pack in the Big 12 as it currently stands. And TCU, they've got a home game with West Virginia uh, on Monday that they'll play before they they come to Manhattan. So it's going to be important for K-State moving forward. You keep losing road games and you don't steal at least one, your margin for error becomes a lot more thin because – there were less games to be played. And if K-State got to six win tonight, we're saying, oh, man, you only have to win three of your final seven games. That feels doable, especially considering the fact that you have four of them at home. But we'll see how K-State plays it out. Yeah, it puts, again, added pressure to winning Saturday where you think that you have to win every single home game. And especially against West Virginia, you you probably have to do it in convincing fashion to move up even a little bit in the net. So it it puts so much pressure on you to win your home games when you don't win a game. And and I'll say that I'm a little more concerned than I was uh, coming into this game just because of how the game played out. K-State did not play well for 32 minutes of this game and were pretty non-competitive until the very end. So I, I'm a little more concerned on that end. It, it's good that they fought back, but you that's a game where you wonder where was that effort and that team for the first 35 minutes? Because it was, it was the first game where we got to see the good and the bad, like like you talked about uh, before we started recording. Mm-hmm. You got to see the good K-State and the bad K-State, but you got to see the bad a lot more, and I think that's what's concerning me. Yeah, I mean, case this K-State team, more than any team, and I think you could say this about a lot of teams in a lot of different sports every single year, but th- this is a true Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type of team where like the, the highs with this team, it's beating Baylor and Kansas, and the lows of this team, it is 
losing at Oklahoma State and only scoring, what, 12 points in the second half against Nebraska and getting blown out on your home floor by them, getting blown out by OU, and having giant stretches of games where you look non-competitive and like, you know, the worst team in this league that has teams like West Virginia and Oklahoma State in it. So I, it's just it, like you said earlier, this team, they lack maturity at times. And we've talked about that at the different points this year. Like just pretty much everybody on this team is in a totally different role than what they've ever been used to. Or you're relying on guys that are, aren't used to this level of play even. And that's a tricky thing. So this is a tough deal. And, and like, you know, I, I think there are some people that are down on Jerome Tang at times. Like, look, I think Jerome Tang has had his missteps this year. But at the end of the day, I think he's doing close to as good of a job as he can with the cards that he's been dealt. Um, it's not been an easy season personnel-wise. Obviously, they are missing two guys that they thought that they would have as major minute dudes at the start of the season. And, you know, you, you had to scramble and get some things done. And, you, you know, you're, you're doing the best with it. And you've also, like, you've got certain guys that, Cam Carter has taken a step forward and is a better player than he was last year, but he didn't touch the ball enough last year for us to realize that he was this much of a you know turnover prone type of guy. You have to take the good and the bad with Cam Carter. Tyler Perry has come in; he's not made shots like you expected him to. You've still gotten some out of him, but you need you needed a better Tyler Perry. You haven't gotten it. I think really the only guy that you know has has been close to to as good or better than what you thought is probably Arthur Kaluma. Um now he's got turnover issues too. So he and Cam Carter are kind of the same. But there's just a lot of things going on with this team that uh at the end of the day, like I'm not going to be surprised if we're saying they beat TCU by 15 and I'm not going to be surprised if we're saying they lost by 15 to TCU next Saturday. Yeah the the killer for for this team for me is just the amount of mind-numbing self-inflicted turnovers yeah. that happen per game where they either throw the ball out of bounds or they don't catch the ball. Like I I think Cam Carter had two or three turnovers where he just didn't catch the ball tonight. Yeah, I think officially he was credited with two of them, but I, it felt like there was more in the game. He only ended up with four turnovers in the stats. It felt like there were more. I think that just goes to show, like what you're saying, how hard to fathom some of the mistakes K-State makes are because, man, it, it, you'd be thinking you're the luckiest team in the world if other guys were doing that for you. And, and that's the difference in tonight's game. K-State turns the ball over 16 times. BYU does it seven. BYU outscores K-State 14 to five and points off turnovers. It's, it is a significant deal. And really, it's the only spot in, in the stats that you can find a discrepancy in which BYU had the edge. I mean, neither team was great at shooting threes. K-State was 10 of 12 at the line. BYU was 10 of 21, so they had the edge there. K-State grabs eight more boards. They don't even get killed on second chance points tonight. It was nine to eight BYU. And, I mean, that was the same total for the offensive rebounds. So it really came down to turnovers tonight, and that's what killed K-State and has really, you know, plagued them all season. But what's crazy is when you when you look at it, only three players tonight that played for K-State had less than one turnover or had one or less turnovers. Uh, Will McNair had one. Day Day Games had zero. David Gasson had zero. Everybody else had at least two. Yeah. That, and, that Including that, Jarrell Colbert, who only played nine minutes and turned the ball over three times. The fact that Casey now has had two post players in the last two games have three turnovers in a game, that is hard to do in college basketball now. And it's happened in back-to-back -back games. Uh, the other thing that will that just kind of pops out to me again is the growing theme of Casey losses is uh, not winning the free throw rate. K-State's now four and seven. Uh, shout out to KSU underscore fan for that stat. Four and seven now in case it doesn't win the free throw rate. Pretty tough. Uh, the last thing I'll say on this is, look, K-State's big three. They they were no-shows for most of the night. Kaluma kind of got it going late, and it was big to get them into the game. Uh, but we've already talked about it. Carter and Perry had brutal nights. Those two guys cannot go one of 14 from three. We, we talked about that after the KU game where they had success and leading up to this one. Uh, the other issue that K-State has, and you're not going to fix it this year, is you have to play Will McNair and Jarrell Colbert. But 
if you could throw those guys together and stir them around and then pour them out of the pot, and it was Jarrell Colbert's defense with Will McNair's offense, you would have a, a serviceable player. And that's what Jerome Tang is having to try and do every single game is press the right buttons to manage, hey, we're – we're not good enough offensively to just, you know, play with three guys, one okay dude, and a total zero out there. Like, we need to try and maximize our offensive output. That's why Will McNair plays. Then you watch Will McNair play defense, and you say, oh, my gosh, he can't hang. Get him out of there. And that's why Jarrell Colbert plays. And then Jarrell Colbert takes the ball and tries to run a fast break <laughs> and turns it over and has two more turnovers and only nine minutes of play. And you say – Oh my gosh, he can't play. Get Will McNair back in there. That is how this works. And I, I, you know, this is where I think Jarrell Colbert, because Will McNair is so maddening at times, it, it, his his lore has grown. And Jarrell Colbert has had good moments this year. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, none of this is a vendetta against Jarrell Colbert. I'm just trying to paint the picture of why it's so tough for Jerome Tang and K State right now is because both guys just aren't smart enough on the respective ends where they already have deficiencies. You know, Will McNair is already a guy that is already a big that doesn't move very well. So he, he's he got to make up for that by being a little bit smarter defensively. He lacks that. Offensively, Jarrell Colbert has to know that, hey, I, I'm not that guy. I My name is not Giannis. I do not get to run the break at six foot 11. Let me stop, slow down, even if it's giving up a fast break opportunity and find a guy that can handle the basketball. That is the thing that K-State has a major problem with. You're not going to fix it at this point this year, and that's where Jerome Tang is just trying to do the best that he can. So uh, I, I I wanted to throw that out there and just and paint that picture and kind of explain because people were, some people were really frustrated about my Jerome Colbert tweet earlier. <laughs> and I, I'm like, look, I get it. And, and I the Iowa State game, I do vividly remember saying that Will McNair cannot play in this game. And that was true. Will McNair could not play in that game because of how Iowa State was doing things. Tonight, you get down big, you got to have the offense. And when guys are so bad that they can't keep themselves on the floor, they, they get taken out. It's why Day Day Ames had stretches there where people were wondering where he was. It's because Jerome Tang would watch a player that, I cannot play him right now. It, it is bad of me as a coach to play him right now. Now, I liked what we saw early from Day Day Ames tonight. Just, you know, it's 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 going to be a work in progress there. But uh, I think the last two games have been a really solid step in the right direction for Day Day Ames. He's just he's still young and got a lot to figure out. He's especially taking a jump from three. Uh, I'll also point out, I think the the one real bright spot, I think, from this game uh, from a personal standpoint, because there were a lot of people that were pretty bad for most of the game. Arthur Kaluma stat line ends up looking pretty good but he looked like he was on another planet for the first 32 minutes of the game. Uh, but David Gasson, I think, really took a step today and played pretty well. Nine points, seven rebounds, four of five from the field, made his one free throw. That's probably the best David Gasson has played in a long time. True. And, and really kind of got back to the old David Gasson, but added more rebounds. And it's probably unfortunate, and I – you know, I don't know. We're we're doing this and and everything without knowing exactly what Jerome Tang is saying after the game, but it's unfortunate. Probably David Gasson was dealing with the his, you know his lingering knee issue, mm -hmm. and that's probably the the reason why he played only twenty four minutes tonight. Because, like you said, he didn't turn it over. Nine points, seven boards, four or five from the field. That's really good for David Gasson, and and I think we talked about it. Going back, David Gasson had struggled to grab rebounds recently for K State. You go and look; uh, he had not grabbed seven rebounds since that game against West Virginia. So he started Big Twelve play with fourteen boards against UCF and seven against West Virginia. And since then, it had been six, five, two, three, one, one, and then he had seven against Kansas. So this was a good week for David Gasson, moving back towards the right direction and. When he gets healthy, that's going to be a big help because he is a little bit more of a complete player than what McNair and Colbert is. He honestly, he's probably what you get if you dump Colbert and McNair together. 
And it's like, it's not an overwhelming player. He's still going to be wildly frustrating and he's going to have some issues, but there are going to be stretches where you can rely on him to do the right things and finish and grab some boards. And it's, I, I would assume that's probably why we didn't see too much of David Gasson tonight because the, the knee was probably still giving him problems. And that's why this is probably a good week for K state to, to have some time off reset because this is a big stretch to finish the year with seven games. I also think you get that David Gasson. You could probably play Kaluma at the four and Gasson at the five yeah. and just play really small against certain teams. So it, that that's where I think I would be with Gasson. Uh, but the the real overarching thing to go with this game, too, is that k State's just not going to win a game where Tyler Perry is two of 11 and one of nine from three. It, that, yeah. that is just a killer. Yeah, it's it's pretty maddening that it seems like he didn't want to use the KU game as a as a jumping off point to continue. Seemed like there was a lot of hesitancy to take shots uh, in the game where it's like uh, you're a shooter, you're open, take that. And so a little bit of a frustrating night from Tyler Perry and and using the term little in there probably doesn't do it enough justice. Uh, real quick, this is the final thing. This is a bit of a look ahead, but um, certainly something that that makes sense. TCU is not like teams in the past. Like, there's not big Eddie Lampkin hogging the middle. That is probably a game next weekend where you can go small if you're K-State and go Gasson at the five if he's healthy and then Kaluma at the four and then play Carter, Perry, and Day-Day. Or, you know, if you feel like you can get minutes out of Dorian Finister, but he he wasn't great tonight, you can do it because that's a team that, I mean, Micah Peavy is going to play the four for him at 6'8". So Ernest Dude is really the only true big they have. He's six eleven. That's he's the only guy over six nine that plays for TCU. So that's just an option for them, uh, and we'll see kind of how things go down uh, next week against the Horn Frogs. But K State drops to five and six in Big Twelve play. They are still treading water, trying to kind of like this game. They're trailing, but they're biding enough time to give themselves a chance to play catch up and sneak back into the NCAA tournament picture. But just like tonight's game against BYU, they have to make sure that they don't wait too long and start picking up wins a little too late. You know, you can't lose a bunch in the middle and then say, hey, we finished strong because we won games at Cincinnati, I, KU, and then at home against Iowa State. Got to take care of business starting right now. And K-State gets a whole week to think about how they do that against TCU. So, that will do it for Drew and I. We will be back tomorrow with KSU underscore fan uh, in the afternoon with the KSO Sunday show. So we'll recap the entire week of K-State basketball, do a lot of looking ahead and trying to determine what the next step is for K-State and uh, breaking down what is to come for the rest of the season. Full coverage of K-State basketball and football as well over at kstateonline.com. So head over there to get the latest from Drew and DY. And uh, that, that'll do it for us tonight or this morning as we wrap this up. BYU wins at 72-66 to over K-State. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online.